welcome to another episode of Talk Now. My name is Chow Ying. I have many roles in my life, but today I'm just a friend to Ravi, my good friend from Singapore, and uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about his work, his life, and you know the recent case in Nagan who was executed in Singapore, and Ravi was really, really involved in that case. Um, let me just introduce. Yeah, I'm Ravi. <laughs> He is a really a good friend. We know each other for a long time. International human rights law practice in Singapore, but he is now going everywhere international, and he been doing a lot of human rights cases in Singapore. And to be honest, there are not many lawyer in Singapore that can uh, be called human rights lawyers and stand up against the uh, states for to protect the vulnerable group, especially the death penalty. Cases, so, Ravi. Yes. Welcome. <laughs> Maybe you can uh, just start to you know introduce yourself a little bit. Maybe I have missed something when I introduce you. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm I'm Ravi, and uh, I'm an international human rights lawyer, and um, I've been going through recently a lot of challenges amidst this Nagendra's case. I've also lost my right to practice law in Singapore, but uh, that has always uh, driven me to navigate the challenges and calibrate what I, how I can be effective uh, not just in Singapore but internationally like uh, what uh, Charwin was mentioning. So maybe you just you know tell us a little bit about how you, you do you still remember your first case you know how you came about in this uh, defending the death penalty cases in Singapore. So there was in 2003 that was the turning point 2003 mm. that was the turning point whereby the case of Vignesh Murthy, the Malaysian case, um, where um, Mr. J.B. Jaradnam, the former opposition uh, MP of Singapore, um, referred the case to me because he was a bankrupt at that time. And then uh, it was the first miscarriage of justice case on the eve of the execution. Somehow, you know, I, I, I took up the case out of uh, compassion for the family because no one wants to do the case and the case has run its course on the eve of the execution the chief justice of the then chief justice of singapore said that sorry it's too late you can't open the case the case has run its course then i said are you then saying that an innocent man can be hanged because mm. if i can just prove to him to this court he says for want of procedure just because of procedure because procedures are meant to save lives not to just you know kill people so he said that uh, that when I asked this question, are you going to hang an innocent man because of a want of procedure? He said the answer is yes. Mm. And the answer is yes. He repeated. So, and Vignesh Murthy was executed. The next day I went, then the family was struggling. You know, with the Malaysian family of uh, Vignesh Murthy, they had to come to Singapore. The relatives have to come. The prison didn't even give them enough time. By 1 p.m., they were supposed to recover the body. And then they were supposed to do the funeral. And then the family was battling with the state, the police to re recover the body and they want to do a decent funeral, you know. So I was like, after 15 days of lack of sleep and mm. blah, 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 mm. my first experience, horrific experience, I went to the, the, uh, the, the crematorium and then I found that, uh, that uh, the mother was jumping on the hearse mm. of Ignace Murthy, was pummeling his chest because she, his eyes were slightly ajar open and she thought that, you know, it was all hysterical. The mother couldn't just, you know, accept that suddenly the son was killed like this. And then I was asking myself and I looked at this, that um, should a country like Singapore, uh, will our humane response to the death penalty um, destroy our metropolis? Uh, why should our success be tainted with such cruelty, you know? And then I started uh, joining other people and started the Singapore Anti-Death Penalty Campaign. A law and home affairs minister, K. Sean Mugam, says the country's death penalty is a serious deterrent for drug traffickers who would otherwise bring in larger amounts. He has most Singapore residents support the use of the death penalty. And if we... in, you know, in Singapore, we find it so bizarre the manner in which Singapore is holding on to death penalty when death penalty has failed in many countries in the world and so on. Or maybe go backward a bit mm. from your first experience of Vignesh Muti's case mm. until today what do you see you know the changes in terms of people perceptions or people's opinion about the death penalty i personally feel with all these experiences you see yeah, this question about the whole world if you look at it three quarters of the world is opposed to death penalty 
I mean, you have traveled around the world for conferences on death penalty. You know yeah. how that momentum is. Zambia, just which a country in Africa which had so much of problems, death penalty issues, last week abolished the death penalty. You know, uh, the, the president announced. So we see that uh, the world is actually generally opposed to death penalty. It's not just, uh, you know, some European countries and so on. So with that momentum moving, I know that this de death penalty will be abolished in Singapore at some point. The question is, how many Nagindrans are we going to lose? Yeah. How many Pauzi, another Malaysian Sarawakian, who also has uh, IQ, 67, uh, intellectually disabled, he's also going to be executed any time. I think we got to really, really focus on that as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, the, the Nagan case, um, um, the civil society actually organized a, a, a protest yes. or a, a, in, in the in speakers', speakers corner. corners. And it was really surprising that more than 500 people actually came out mm. to support that campaign. You know, do you, do you see that changes? Mm -hmm. Do you see that um, people are actually opening up? People, we claim the freedom. You know, its freedom is never given to us on a silver platter, right? So, but your observation is right. In Nagendran's case, because of the nature of the case itself, it has drawn a lot of international attention. It has actually, I see that in Speaker's Corner, more young people, mm. as, 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 as young as 18, 17, 15, they're all turning up, turned up at Speaker's Corner. There's a lot of support. So the discourse is moving up, you know. Mm. And also the Nagendran's, the Sentai funeral, and you can see that the reaction usually people will have about death penalty cases, right? It's a bit different because of the fact that people really can see that someone is being killed. Yeah. There's a coffin, there's a funeral going on, there's a mother crying. So this was all absent in the previous death penalty cases where it's like almost, uh, there's no face to it. Yeah. Yeah. Singapore has this very weird thing. They will take pictures of the death row inmates mm -hmm. a day before the executions. And I have seen like Prabhagaran yeah. photo, nicely, nicely dressed, before, think, yeah. yeah, just a few days before. And then the next picture you see is, is, is a coffin, yeah. right? It, it does really have the impact. But why is it that there's such a weird thing of having this photograph? I mean, how would the family, I'm sure you deal with the family a lot. How, how do they, um, Ex, you know, perceive these this pictures things. Mm. I think that, uh, you know, like they used to say that, you know, China, they will just ask the family to buy the bullet or something like that, or to, to choose or something like that. So in Singapore, I think that this kind of makeup, this kind of uh, whereby, you know, it's what, another a, a form of uh, punishment. What, what is the reason cruelty. for that? I, I really find it until yeah. today, I cannot find figure out the reason. Yeah. No official response on this. In fact, I've questioned that in my book called Hung and Dawn, which I published in 2005, where I raised this, I was shocked when I received the pictures from the mother of uh, this lady, Lakshmi, I mean, yeah. um, uh, Madam Lakshmi, whose son, Shanmugam, was executed. And then she said that these are the pictures they gave just before he was executed. Yeah. And it's like so many pictures, like he's like a, like a model yeah. behind the table, giving yeah. and all in suit. And then you give the family and yeah. then they hang that picture. Yeah. I just don't understand why they have to do all this. Yeah. And that is why this kind of cruelty is just unbelievable. Yeah. 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 So is there any particular incidents, you know, that really stuck in your mind when you see the you know the family? Any particular one? No, actually really? there's this thing about uh, um Vignes Murti's one which which had the biggest impact on me because the first time yeah. I see that uh, you know the state is like snatching away the body from the family and the family want the proper funeral mm. you know for the Malaysian relatives come and they are poor mm. just because they can't afford the money you know I mean that's the reason why they couldn't send it to the so I stepped in to use my own savings to send the body to an embalming uh, services in the end uh, they charged me like eight thousand dollars for the funeral mm. I have to do all these things yeah. but what I'm saying is that um, it's transfer trauma that mm. over the years I go through at the funeral, I go through with the family, mm. I go through, and my financially I'm also ruined because each time I have to, I try to support as much as possible. But coming out of it, again, I don't have a proper rest. So over the years, it also like, you know, we do it at high personal cost as well. Yes. You know? Yes. So 
it is a, it is it is a culmination. I mean, like the all these things, just tell us why are we all doing this at the end of the day? It's because it is so fundamentally wrong mm. for the state to plan an execution of an individual. You are perpetuating so much of violence. How are we going to teach a young kid who's watching this, you know, that to to, to murder a person? Yeah. 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 Like Nagendran, I mean, it's so bizarre that they can yeah. just kill an intellectually disabled boy. And it's just, I mean, just put yourself in a situation of the family. You were waiting six o'clock in the morning in your home, knowing that your son is going to be killed. Okay, now, and you can't do anything. No, I'm going to ask you a question. No! Instead, <laughs> instead you know, is that um, how would you respond to those people who say that, oh, you know, how about those families who are fed potentially about this drug? Yeah, I mean, I think. They also have the feel, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think. This is not a simple, you know, using the death penalty to say that you solve a complicated uh, social issues like drug addiction. Yes. It's just a lazy way and it's not effective. You know, everybody will say that let's kill those people who, uh, who, who tra traffic drugs or career drug. But the issues of drug addictions in a society keep going up. And it is actually because of other issues that that leads to that. Because I'm so, also saying this yeah. is because, you know, follow up to Nagindran's case in Malaysia now and uh, other Malaysian media that I, I read about this, yeah. they posted about Singapore's, again, a group of guys, you know, traffic drugs, look at this, you know, oh, that's the reason why death penalty should be imposed. Again, it's the reverse because the fact that death penalty, yeah. it's, it has failed because if there is justice, it should also bring the mastermind there, mm -hmm. the people who create the problem, not the mules. You know, they are not the source of the problem. So if you can't bring to justice the masterminds, then just bringing the meals doesn't give justice. Yeah. That's, that's a simple, uh, you know, my real response to that. But do you think that the mastermind deserve a bad death penalty also? No, it's not so much that mastermind. If, if you impose death penalty on mules, then you should then be more effective in cracking the entire a death penalty scheme. You can't crack it because masterminds are so powerful. Have you ever got a mastermind? If you have not, then your system has failed. Yeah. Which is why people have abolished death penalty because it's useless. Exactly. Yeah. I think even in, yeah. in the United Nations, yeah. it was like uh, a consensus among all the country that death penalty or punitive punishments is not yeah. uh, solutions to the drug problems. Yes. You know, it, it has been proved in many countries and but. Singapore, Malaysia, we still have the, yeah. the death penalty. I mean, like, see, in Singapore, I mean, Singapore is an international financial city. So is Hong Kong. Yeah. You know, they always mention about Singapore. Oh, Singapore is an international financial city. We have to pro protect the society and all that. You mean to say Hong Kong has not protected the society? Yeah. Hong Kong, mm -hmm. there's a study shown that Hong Kong and Singapore, there's a comparison made, and Hong Kong is successful in deterring death penalty without, uh, deterring drugs without death penalty. Yeah. And, and also uh, murder and so on and so forth. Can Singapore just look at their studies and see how they did it? Why are you like so obsessed with killing that you don't want to see it? And uh, there is a link with Malaysia. I think if this show is, is a Malaysian mm -hmm. now, um, and you have handled a few of the Malaysian cases in Singapore, mm -hmm. what do you see the, the similarity? You know, what no, should Malaysian yeah. do actually? No, actually the thing is that um, um, what Malaysia is doing currently, which is a moratorium on death penalty, which is very good because they are taking steps to abolish it or at least have a discussion because Malaysia has recognized that it has, that death penalty is not a deterrent uh, and, and therefore we need to sit down and discuss. How long it takes, that's another question altogether. But the fact is that during this time, they, they have recognized that more lives unnecessarily shouldn't be lost. Mm. I think Singapore should take a similar approach for a moratorium and sit down properly. But the thing is, you know, um, Singaporeans will say that all these Malaysians come in you know, and bring drugs in. So why should we give them, you know, an uh, uh, opportunity, uh, a second chance? But here in Malaysia, we are also saying that, you know, look, there are circumstances to these families and to, to, to the cases so, how would the Malaysians uh, appeal to the Singaporeans to look into a bigger, uh, you know, a bigger mm. pictures and a bigger instead of like, this is my country. I want to protect my country from foreign uh, intruders and things like that.
Yeah, you know, the thing is that Singapore government is constantly not wanting to confront the reality. The reality in Singapore is that, leaving aside Malaysians, most of the executions, uh, the, if you look at the profile of the ethnic composition, mm. which one of the constitutional challenges which I did on behalf of 17 death row inmates who happen to be Malays, uh, Malay Muslims, and the basis of the constitutional challenge was that amongst that 26 of the death row inmates, about 100 percent, 77 percent mm. of the death row inmates are Malays, mm -hmm. and also Malays comprise 13 percent of the population, one three. So it's not just overrepresentation in mm. in America. Mm. If the black population, it's overrepresented, but not this kind of overrepresentation. I mean, 77 percent mm. of the population in the death row are Malays. So it's shocking. It's shocking to the conscience that this minority community mm. uh, needs redress, uh, a proper redress. There, there is actually, even if there is no actual discrimination, mm. even if there's no actual discrimination, um, if they say that there's no actual discrimination, but one needs to question this statistics of over-representation. Are they Singaporeans? Singaporeans. Ah. Uh, one of them, I think, is a Malaysian. Mm. Yeah, one of the 17, I think, is a Malaysian. But the problem is that this itself is a problematic uh, statistics, mm. you know, which is why we need to ask why. Mm. And also inherently uh, that uh, there's also this problem about drug, drug consumption problem amongst the Malay community as well. Mm. There is over-representation, I think maybe more than 50%. That, that the Ministry of Home Affairs had also recognised that there are structural issues. If there are structural issues for drug consumption, you mean to say there are no structural issues for drug trafficking? Mm. Do you see the policymaker, politicians debate this in the parliament and if not, why not? Yeah, yeah. I mean the thing is that uh, if you look at the space between Singapore and Malaysia, Singapore, I mean when I even travel in this last two days itself, I could see so much of vibrancy in terms of the discussion, uh, the space, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, all these things have opened up you know, in Malaysia. It's Singapore is like still the old Malaysia, which is like a stranglehold on, on all these fundamental liberties, you know. So I think to be fair, the Singapore Democratic Party, uh, the parties like the Reform Party, they have actually talked about the death penalty, but they are also sensitive to the electorates, so to speak. Mm. But I think in the coming years, death penalty, I think, is a topic because it has ignited a lot of interest. Uh, recently, yeah. Yeah, but do you do you see any of the politicians actually stand up and make a stand against the death penalty? I think that uh, there are politicians who have done that, not in parliament. Mm. Mm. And do you see that the the civil society or even uh, journalists, reporters, writers, blogger, you know, do you see that they have um, more space now? Uh, to write about the death penalty issue. I think it's because of the social media yeah. and because of the evolution of the information technology that people are able to actually communicate in better platforms, uh, not necessarily whether, whether there was a space in Singapore and so in Singapore government and needs little space, they will try to <laughs> close that space immediately. Yeah. But they, they do have a fake news act, right? Yeah, yeah they yeah. have. How, yeah. how does it affect uh, the you know, discussions? I mean, the thing is that uh, if there's fake news and the law, uh, that uh, particular ministry will just give notice and then you're immediately supposed to take down and then and the whole process is, yeah. is, is complicated. Do, do you know of any like uh, voices being being uh, being suppressed in that way? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, definitely because of the fact that uh, you have, I mean, the government of Singapore has a huge um, state media at its disposal they can do a lot of PR damage and campaign against anyone, which they all often do. So therefore, you can respond, you know, mm. who says that, you know, like, oh, this particular issue is like so volatile that it can cause so much a problem. And there are enough uh, legislation like uh, Maintenance of Religious Harmony Act, the Internal Security Act to deal with all these um, mm. other issues, which affects like, you know, they always talk about racial harmony and all that, you know, this kind of tensions. This can, there are ex enough existing laws. Singapore is just has too much of law. <laughs> too much of law and I don't know. <laughs> you see, when a population is just over-regulated, 
before when you want to smoke, you have to think so hard. I mean, can you imagine a smoker will become a, actually a chain smoker because of that, the stress. Yeah. You know, you have to find <laughs> uh, how many meters, and then you find some meter, then you got to find distance, and then you got to don't know what, so yeah, many Yeah, but the government says that Singapore is a safe place. You can walk in the middle of the night and you don't have to worry about things. Which is why oh, Singapore is the most stressed society. <laughs> I mean, there's so many surveys, Singaporeans are not having enough sex, <laughs> not, and then uh, the most stressed up society in the world. So, and Singaporeans are one of the most un unhappiest in the region. So, your economic growth and all that, does it really help? I mean, like so-called economic growth, does it translate into real happiness? Mm. I mean, you want to have money is because you want to be happy, right? You want to be satisfied. But if it does not bring you happiness, if it brings stress and unhappiness, is it real growth? So I'm coming back to you mm. because you 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 are going you have gone through a lot of stress periods, mm. right? You know. And just now you say that every case that you did have a have put on you some some impact, right? Mm. So how do you actually deal with it? And and the last few mm. questions, mm. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. Mm. Yeah. Is is your recent case uh, on Nuggets, you know, you have fought so hard, we have seen, you know, what amazing work that you have done. But at the same time it it can be a huge cost, yeah. right? So how, how do you deal with that? What, what, what's happened actually? Mm. Yeah. The simple way I deal with that is to have copio. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's basically my own sense of sense of uh, I know. humor. This is, humor. Yeah, this is nonsense, You know my nonsense. <laughs> la. So my own sense of humor to count, to, to stay <laughs> sane in Singapore. Yeah. Because I think, you know, they will declare you this, they will declare you that very easily. So I think that, um, I think it was also my spiritual uh, notion to life mm. about the transience of uh, this whole life and, 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 and my uh, basically philosophy, Hindu philosophy towards mm. my, exist my own existence and my connectivity to the universe that gives me the inspiration and the strength. Otherwise, you'll be like very frustrated. Mm. I don't have that kind of bitterness against my country or the people or anything of that sort. People always will say, ah, yeah, you do so much for Singaporeans. Don't bother about them. Like, you know, just, you know, have good life like other lawyers. You can be successful yeah. and yeah. all that, you know. But I just feel that uh, if I don't do this, I won't be who I am. Yeah. In the sense that not so much popularity or anything of that sort. It is just, it, it sits in well within what I feel as a human being that I should do mm. during this journey. So, yeah. So we also see that, you know, um, Nagan's mother have to file the application. Yes. Has, she has to appear in court herself. Mm. You know why? Why has Singapore come to this stage that you know the mother herself have to? It's, it is. It is very very clear that it has come to the toxic stage of fear. Mm. You know, lawyers, lawyers like even leave Nagendra's case, Dachina Murthy. Yeah, that's A court Murthy. proceeding is going on, and the state can actually just. Uh, you know, they're going, to, they're going to execute a boy yeah. whose hearing is actually in two weeks or three weeks away. And then, and he, it's, it's a perfect case, he, any lawyer will win this case. Mm. It was so clear. Mm. But a winning case, not an abuse of process kind of a case. But we went around asking for lawyers. I mean, they went around asking for lawyers, the family. But no, no lawyers want to, you know, even turn up. And they're very frightened about this cost order and stuff like that. So if lawyers are frightened, mm. that tells a lot about society. Yeah. It is they are supposed to be the vanguard of rights. Yeah. It's not like Malaysia Bar Council, which champions people's rights. Even Nagendran's case, police came and just took some particulars of the lawyers. Mm -hmm. But no one is like really frightened. You have that solidarity and support and courage here, you see. But we don't have that. So lawyers are individually targeted like myself. But I develop some skills uh, to, to, to navigate and so on and so forth. But that's, that's, that does not mean that I don't have my own anxiety. I don't want to pretend like I'm a hero. I go through my challenges. I mean, you have, you have seen me over the years. So I, 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 it just, so again, it has put a very difficult situation in Singapore that it has come to oppressed state whereby even lawyers are so frightened. So Rayu, you were born in 1969. Oh my God. Sorry, I, I reveal your age. Yeah, I'm people, so sorry. <laughs> yeah, those. but um, so you, you are that generation of Singaporeans. By the way, you are. Uh, <laughs> <okay. laughs> so, um, I mean, so what, what, what do you, I mean, in these generations that you grew up in Singapore, you yeah. know, in a bubble, the propaganda from yeah. the government, do you see difference from the old generation, your generation and mm. the future generation? No, you see the, pre, the, the, the that generation of the 60s, they all, I mean, I grew up, I mean, you know, I mean, in the early 70s watching all this um, 
these people from Singapore citizens from 60s and 50s and all that, because that's, that generation is a very socialist environment. Mm. There's a lot of discourse about freedom of speech and all these things, you know. So I think that it was more robust. But now, because of tech, the, the information technology and internet and so on and so forth, the younger generation are definitely questioning. They're questioning everywhere. So I think that there will be a shift in Singapore. If the government doesn't realize soon, I think they're going to get a tight slap at mm. the next general election. And it, it is coming. Mm. You know, like for, for example, they slapped me with the cost order. The public is slapping them back mm. by paying up the cost order as well. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. So how do you see forward, way forward? The way forward is that we have to continue to march forward. Like for myself, I don't want to throw in the towel and say that, oh, I ran away from Singapore. No, I will stick to the fight. I will do what is right. I will do, I will connect myself with the world. The world is out there, which is watching what's happening in Singapore. Mm. Singapore cannot bullshit itself. It's ways like the way it has been doing. Thank you, Ravi, for this uh, really lively interview. Uh, we really hope that Malaysia and Singapore both work towards the abolition of death penalty for all crime you know, in the future. Thank you very much. And uh, so till the next episode of Talk Now. Thank you. Goodbye.